Stay hungry, stay foolish. Welcome to part one of the Exponential series here on The Innovation Show, where we'll cover how exponentially changing technologies are advancing and colliding to change the shape of the world and the business world as we know it. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services, empowering its customers by making innovative financial services accessible to all. Check them out on hellozai.com. You can win a copy of today's book, The Exponential Era by David Espindola. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you will be in with a chance to win that book. Today's book introduces the exponential era. The extraordinary times we are living where the convergence of technology platforms that grow at exponential rates is creating unprecedented opportunities for companies that know how to benefit from this time and disastrous results for those that don't. In today's book, we learn about the mega trends shaping the future of business and society. The exponential platforms that are creating astonishing opportunities and risks and the types of companies that thrive in this environment and those that are being destroyed. We will also learn about a robust methodology called SPX that challenges the current thinking in strategic planning and provides an effective playbook for companies to stay ahead of the exponential curve. Finally, our guest provides a thoughtful discussion about the impact of exponential era on humanity and how the rapid changes we are experiencing today challenge our current societal structures, economics, and ethics. It's a great pleasure to welcome author of the exponential era, strategies to stay ahead of the curve in an era of chaotic changes and disruptive forces. David Espindola, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. I'm a great fan of your show, and uh, I'm delighted to uh, be able to participate in the show with you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. You packed so much in here, including your own methodology, which I'm dying to get into. But you raise so many questions throughout the book. And you open the book with the story of a company. You tell us to keep in mind that this company was the undisputed leader in its industry. They continued to experience year over year net revenue gro growth, healthy margins, rewarding investors with solid dividends and repurchasing a significant amount of stock and shares. The repurchase of shares might have been a sign of uncertainty about the company's prospects and an attempt to boost the share price in the short term. However, the leadership team displayed nothing but total confidence in the company's ability to stay competitive and grow. But you were concerned. Despite the company's position as a category king in its market, was this potential for disruption that we mentioned in the introduction. This, David, is such a challenge. Many organizations out there see no need for innovation, innovating, reinvention, disruption of any kind because they do not see the disruption coming. But the disruption is exponential and therefore catches so many off guard. Absolutely. So, you know, this is a classic example of a very successful company. And success can be a double-edged sword, right? If you are comfortable with success and you don't see the changes that are coming, that can be very dangerous. So this is a company that was in the middle of the storm, you know, a company that had been around for uh, more than 100 years, very successful in their business, very profitable, high margins in their industry. But they were still operating, you know, in a traditional business model. Uh, they had thousands of employees. They had a legacy infrastructure. They weren't moving very fast. <clears throat> and then comes um, new players into the market that bring with them uh, fast, cheap technology, uh, a mindset of innovation. And they were looking to, you know, take market share from this legacy company. And so, you know, they had to really think about the future and understand how the emerging technologies were going to completely transform their industry and how they, they had to adapt to this new uh, environment. 
there's so much behind this like we talk we'll talk in a second about exponential curve we'll explain to our audience what that means but there's a convergence that's happening as well and this is difficult to understand because we've rarely in our period on this planet experienced so many convergence of different platforms different technologies and this is important to understand and i'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit and actually ask you to tell our audience about the convergence of these different things because you say we would have to go back to the late 1800s and early 1900s to see just three significant innovation platforms coming together over several decades. At the time, they were electricity, the telephone, and the internal combustion engine. But today, there are at least 10 of these platforms that you call them, depending on how you categorize them, that have surfaced in the last few decades. And it's not the fact that they're all arising at the same time, it's that they're starting to interact AI and IoT, for example, blockchain and AI, they're all changing the landscape at a rapid pace. And this is the real trick that's catching people off guard. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, to the point of how you catch these platforms, uh, if you listen to Kathy Wood, for example, you know, she's the CEO of ARK Invest. And uh, she has defined five categories. So she focused on um, AI, blockchain, uh, energy storage, uh, robotics, and gene sequencing. So the way she categorized these platforms is fairly close to the way we think about them, uh, except that instead of um, you know energy storage, we, we think of material science, which is a broader term. Uh, and instead of uh, gene sequencing, we think of biotech, which is also a, a broader way to think about the, uh, the platform. And then we also added a few more. So we added quantum computing, which we believe in and of itself deserves a, a category. Uh, IoT, uh, which is also a, an incredible technology. And then 3D printing, which you know, we think is going to be uh, very transformative in many different industries. So you can categorize them in different ways, you know, but the point is we have about a dozen or so new exponential platforms that are growing at very, very fast speeds and are converging. So just like you said, you know, one feeds into the other and it creates a combinatorial multiplier that is totally uh, mind blowing. It's just, uh, we've never ever experienced a period of time like the period of time we're living in today. Um, and what's gonna happen in the next you know, 20, 30, 40 years is going to be uh, absolutely unbelievable. Let's give our audience a little bit more context because listeners to the show are familiar with the challenge of exploit mode versus explore mode or innovation mode. And you say that companies that are successful navigate through the inevitable turbulence in their markets because they're able to balance that exploitation and exploration equation. Their journey is typically marked by a series of consecutive S-curve jumps characterized by an initial period of exploration, then growth, and then eventually a plateau. The example you give is IBM, who moved through several S-curve jumps in its long history, starting with counting machines and typewriters, then moving into mainframe computing, client-server software, consulting services, and finally cloud computing. And you add to this that ambidextrous organizations are able to traverse several S-curves from the plateau of exploitation to the initiation of exploration because the leadership team can articulate a vision and a set of values of the company that pr promote a common identity, even if the culture of the exploiting business units is different than that of the exploring units. These leaders own their ambidextrous strategy and are comfortable designing separate business units that, despite their differences, share common values and can collectively pursue goals and objectives. They are able to allocate resources and solve conflict while maintaining alignment with the broader goals of the organization. I thought that was such an important point because in this book for our audience, David explores all these converging technologies, gives us examples of organizations who have both thrived and fi failed in this period of VUCA of change, but also then the technology, but also, like I said here, shines 
a very large light on the fact that culture is absolutely essential to the success of innovation within an organization. I'd love you to talk about this a little bit before we go into some of the examples and then we bring the SPX methodology to life. Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. So let's start with the S curve so that your audience understands what that is. So basically what we're talking about is you have an exponential curve, right, where things in the beginning as technology is, is evolving, uh, things don't move very fast, but then uh, you hit an inflection point and then things start happening very, very fast. And you have that, that exponential curve. Eventually that plateaus, right? And then what used to be uh, an exploration becomes an exploitation. And so companies that have been successful for several decades, and I think IBM is the classic example. You know, they've been around as a tech company for more than 100 years. They're able to go from one S-curve to the next. So they started with typewriters, right? And then they moved into mainframe computers. Then they moved into PCs. And then they moved into the cloud. And then they moved into service. And it just goes on and on and on. And they're always moving from one S-curve to the, to the next. So, um, you know, that's an example of a company that has been able to successfully uh, balance exploitation with exploration. And we don't know how much longer they will be able to do that, but so far, so good. Um, and we believe that that's the way that companies need to operate in the current environment. You need to be able to do both. Um, so, and that's, that's where the ambidextrous concept comes from. Um, and so um, the, the, the thinking is that, um, you know, companies are able to have both um, exploration, exploitation under one umbrella, but some companies uh, prefer to have them as separate business units. And that sometimes makes sense because, you know, the leadership skills that you need for exploration may be different than exploitation. Um, but you want to be careful that you don't create two separate companies with two separate visions and values and, and culture, right? So that unification of the vision, unification of the values and, and the culture is very important so that you have a cohesive organization and that everybody's marching towards the same goals. Uh, but within that umbrella, you may have different leadership, you may have different business units that are working on exploration and exploitation. So you mentioned there the exponential curve so the s curve but the way it works exponentially and let's talk exponential here because it is very very difficult for the human brain to understand exponential growth and you say to this date people still do not understand the power of the exponential curve perhaps this is a reflection of its deceiving nature and how the exponential curve manifests itself in a way similar to the line in Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, gradually, then suddenly. And perhaps it is a reflection of the fact that the exponential is simply too difficult a concept to grasp for brains evolved to work efficiently based on timing of circadian rhythms that function best with emotive images and prefer to think linearly. It'd be great if you'd unpack exponential curves as much as possible, as much as we can over the airwaves like this. Yeah, I'll be uh, happy to do that. And this is a really important concept. It's really important to understand why it's so difficult to understand exponential and how it impacts organizations. So let's, uh, let's take a look at, you know, in the book itself, I, I give one example, which is uh, the example of the legend of the origins of the game of chess, right? And uh, the, the, the story goes that um, the inventor presented the game of chess to an emperor in India. The emperor loved the game and said, you know, what do you want in return? And the inventor said, well, just give me one grain of rice for the first square, two for the second, four for the third, and so on until you fill all 64 squares. And the emperor says, yeah, okay, I, I'm surprised that all he wants are a few grain of, of rice, and he, you know, granted his wishes. Uh, until his, um, you know, accountant realized that what we were talking about here was 18 quintillion, uh, that's 18 followed by 18 zeros, grains of rice, which is, you know, even in 
modern times with the production capabilities that we would have, it would take 10 years to produce that much rice, right? So um, I, I think that um, sort of exemplifies the fact that we think linearly and we don't really, really understand the power of exponential. Now, there's another example that I like to give as well. Maybe we should do this together as, as an exercise. I think it would be fun to do it. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take a, a regular eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, okay? And we'll start folding it in half. So what happens here is every time I fold it in half, I'm doubling the thickness of this piece of paper, right? So I've doubled it once, now twice, now three times, and four times, now five times, and maybe I can do one more time. So I can do it about six times, and then it gets really hard to continue uh, doubling it, right? So you can see that I came up with something that's about maybe less than an inch thick, right? And I doubled it six times. If I could continue to do this, 50 times, how thick would this piece of paper get? So if you ask this question to you know, uh, your average audience, the answer you're gonna get, you know, most people are going to come up with a heuristic that will say, well, okay, so I did it six times and I'm about one inch, so I'm gonna do it 50 times. Uh, I'm gonna multiply by a factor of 10. So you know, 10 times six inches, 60 inches, maybe five feet long is, is the average answer that people are gonna get. Um, other people may realize that now we're talking about an exponential curve, right? Because you're doubling uh, the thickness with, with every change. And so they may realize, well, it's, it's not a linear progression, it's an exponential progression. Maybe we'll get to 10,000 feet. Well, they're both extremely wrong. So if we're able to do this 50 times, uh, this piece of paper would be as thick as the distance from the earth to the sun. That's the power of exponential. It's so hard, isn't it, for the human brain to comprehend that? Yeah, and, and you know, I've written about exponential. I didn't know the example of the paper, and I was struggling. I, and you know, because I know the deceptive nature, I was guessing. I was like, I wonder would it get to the moon or something like that, and to the sun, even even further. So crazy, crazy to understand that. And there was a passage I loved here. And I, this is me, this is my curiosity where I kind of went off piste. But I loved how you said that we're living longer. And we tend to think linearly, because that's the way we've evolved. And technology does not work that way. And one of the passages you share really intrigued me, you said, our continued use of agrarian words to describe business activities like seed, as in seed money in the venture world or plant as in initiate a foothold in the market, cultivate business development, for example, harvest to sell cash cows, usually revenue streams that need to be milked for remaining profits before the market collapses or is disrupted, has locked our thinking into a pattern of behaviors completely out of sync with the era in which we operate. In the exponential era, we don't operate on circadian rhythms or agrarian timescales. This is an era marked by the confluence of fast changing technologies that converge to create new ecosystems, resulting in digital disruptions at rapid velocity. And here you say what seemed like a faraway future has become the new reality, and it bears no resemblance to the past. It may appear as it happened suddenly, almost magically, like a marvel that came out of nowhere. But in reality, the future does not just happen at once. As guest of the show, several times guest and brilliant author, Retha McGrath, insightfully noted, it begins to unfold in cadence that allows you to detect early signals, but only if you're paying attention. And this is really important because many organizations, firstly, don't even know how to pay attention, but also think they are paying attention. And it's that kind of issue where people are blind, the blind spots, they're blind to the fact that they don't have all the information available. Yeah, so you, you touched on several points here. So let me just comment on a few of them. So um, one point that you touched on was this, um, the words that we use to describe, you know, the, the business uh, activities and processes today 
Um, so th the credit goes to my co-author, uh, Michael Wright, on that one. And the point that he's trying to make here is that words matter. Um, so, you know, he likes to say that words are the skin of thought. Um, so the words that we use to describe uh, business activities are reflective of our linear thinking. But technology is driving exponential growth. So the danger is that our words may limit, you know, the way we think about, about our business. Um, and then you talked about, you know, Rita McGrath, and, and I've, I've interviewed her as well. And she wrote this marvelous book called Seeing Around Corners. And there's so much, uh, uh, you know, that we, we were able to, to, to learn from that book that we apply to our methodology as well. Um, and the point that she makes is exactly that it's absolutely possible to see the early signals if and only if you're paying attention, right? If you're not paying attention, what happens is when, when you see it, it's obvious to everybody else. And if it's obvious to everybody else, then you're already behind that exponential curve. So the trick is you need to get um, to the part of the curve where things are moving slowly, right? You haven't hit that inflection point yet. You're starting to see the early signals. And that's the time for you to start engaging with experiments and trying different things. Now, some of these things may uh, eventually, you know, hit that inflection point and grow exponentially, or they may not. You don't know, but that's why the experimentation is so important. I thought it would be useful to share Moore's law as well, because Moore's law and exponential growth go hand in hand. And you say it's not just a single exponential curve that's creating disruption, but the confluence of interconnected technologies that we mentioned in the introduction that grow at exponential rates. So they're all growing at this exponential curve. They're all interacting and coming together and powering each other. And as digital technologies influence the advancement of other technologies, the exponential nature of Moore's law reaches broader and more impactful significance. I thought we'd unpack a little bit here because this again helps people even further understand the rate of change just so we can get to a, a level playing field here, what Moore's law says is that computing capacity doubles every 18 months or so. So it's basically our ability to pack more computing power into a silicon chip, right? And we've been able to do this ever since the, the you know, the, the 1960s when, when uh, Morse came up with, uh, with this, this uh, observation. Um, and so, uh, the, the thing that's important here is that computing capacity is what's driving this digital revolution that we're experiencing right now. And, you know, digital is impacting every other information, uh, every other innovation platform. And so when you uh, are powered by Moore's law, uh, you are able to also experience um, exponential growth uh, regardless of what platform we're talking about. So AI is driven by Moore's law, blockchain is driven by Moore's law, even biotechnology is driven by Moore's law. So everything is growing uh, exponentially. Now, we make the point that, um, you know, like everything else, we have uh, accelerants and inhibitors. So, and it's important to understand that because sometimes you know, you may get uh, some pushback saying, well, this particular technology is not exponential. It's not growing that fast. And, and that's going to happen. There's going to be some there are, and some there aren't, and some are going to move faster than others. So we need to understand the accelerants and the inhibitors. So I'll give you an example. We're living through COVID-19 right now. This has been an incredible accelerant for remote work technologies, right? For collaboration technologies. Uh, but then you have inhibitors, like you may have government regulations, for instance, you know, the SEC is looking at, you know, blockchain and, you know, the securitization of tokens, and that could be an inhibitant to the growth of blockchain. Uh, you have insurance that's going to be highly impacted by what we're seeing with transportation, with autonomous vehicles. And you may have insurance lobbyists that don't want that to happen, and they may be influencing the growth of that technology. So you have to take into consideration these accelerants and the inhibitors as you look at the overall ecosystem. 
And that makes it all the more difficult to detect when it will happen as well, because you may know when the technology happens, but then what are these blockers? We see that, for example, like you said, blockchain in the banking industry and financial industry, that there's there's like this string of protection there because of regulation. And uh, that can be difficult because people think they're protected by the regulator. And then if that changes, all of a sudden, they have no capability in the organization to deal with that new reality. But uh, I'll bring it a bit further because you say here that it's important under that aspect that you just talked about to understand what Ray Kurzweil, who is the founder of Singularity University, calls. And he, he came up with this in the 1990s the law of accelerating returns. I thought that was an interesting term again to bolster people's knowledge about the rate of change. Right, right. So what he's getting to is that, you know, there's a tendency for these technological advances to feed on themselves. And, and I'll give you an example. So uh, we are seeing tremendous improvements in material science. And one material uh, specifically that is having an impact on solar energy is uh, perovskite. So uh, what that technology has done is it has accelerated the adoption of solar energy technologies. And with that, we have been able to improve energy storage. And that improvement in energy storage has led to the advent of the electric vehicles. And now electric vehicles are becoming autonomous and they are driving the acceleration of AI and robotics. So it's like a feeding frenzy, right? One thing sort of feeds the other and, and they just keep growing together. I was thinking we'd go into the mega trends that you identify in the book, but I think the best use of our time would be to skip over them for people who want to read about them. And you do a great, great job of giving an overview of each get a copy of the book. And also, we'll touch on the SPX model today. But again, that won't do it justice to understand the depth of that. But all of the mega trends you mentioned in the book will be shaped and accelerated by several exponential platforms, you call them, and I'd love to go into this, that are converging and creating powerful combinatorial change of extraordinary magnitude. You select eight such platforms to illustrate how convergence of these platforms is driving the mega trends discussed earlier in the book and producing exceptional changes to our world. So maybe I'll just give an overview of the, I'll give a, a title for each of these mega trends stroke platforms that you call them, and then you can unpack them and maybe just combine them together, David. So the first is hyper global connectivity, a longer and healthier life, augmented and virtual worlds, abundance, upgraded transportation, instant personalization, digitization of work, automated shopping, radical interfaces and sustainable environment. These are all powered by the earlier stuff, which you can see is just upending the entire landscape in both business, but also in society itself. You know, we think that um, the, the, the times that we're living right now are, like I said before, extraordinary. And the impact to every aspect of our lives uh, is going to be absolutely mind-boggling. So we, we we chose a few megatrends, things that we thought were uh, very likely to happen in the next, you know, several years, maybe decades, um, and the impact that they're going to have in, in business and society. Um, so, you know, uh, like I said, there's a lot to unpack here. I would encourage people to to read the book and, and get more in depth there. But, you know, just in the period of time between the time I published the book and today, things have already evolved. So some of the examples that I gave in the book, uh, if I were to write the book today, I would have much better examples in each of those categories, which is really fascinating. Like, uh, you know, if you look at uh, transportation, for instance, what's happening with transportation as a service is uh, a disruption to the transportation industry, unlike any we've ever seen before. Um, and, and this is not something that, you know, is some guy in, in, a, in a garage dreaming up uh, the possibilities of, you know, robo-taxis, as, as we call them. This is happening today. This is uh, operational in Phoenix. It's operational in Las Vegas. We have autonomous 
electric vehicles that uh, allow you to go from point A to point B. You hail the robo taxi just like you do with Uber, but instead of a driver, you have an autonomous vehicle that comes, picks you up, and takes you everywhere you want to go. And the predictions are that it, with transportation as a service, we'll be able to reduce the cost of transportation by 10 times. Um, so it, it's really, you know, fascinating what's happening in, in that particular industry. And then, you know, there are some other ones that we can go into. If you look at life expectancy, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century, life expectancy was in the mid 40s. Um, and today, you know, we benefit from a life expectancy of about uh, 80 plus years old, right? You expect it to live into your 80s. Um, and this is accelerating super fast. Uh, there are uh, theories, of, of course, you know, we, we can't prove this, but uh, scientists believe that we're going to very quickly move into life expectancy into the 100s. And then you have the really radical thinking that believes that aging is a disease and that we'll be able to cure that disease. So it's really amazing what's happening out there. We've had shows on that, David, on uh, ending aging. We've had Aubrey de Grey on it uh, talking about aging as a disease. So fascinating, really fascinating stuff. And the way, what, what I find so remarkable is that things that were taken as science fiction before are happening in such a rapid time because of that exponential change that all of a sudden they're possible. And it really, reading your book also inspired me to think exponentially where I have been thinking linearly and bear in mind how much I read about this and I live this stuff all the time and I work with organizations. But I was like, um, I, I started asking myself, where am I thinking linearly here? Where am I not looking at the possibilities of the change? And also, as a parent, where am I encouraging my children to think this way? It, it's important for the future for everybody, I think, as well. But let, let's keep going because I wanted to highlight one of the one of the changes that again is going to catapult so many businesses into different directions that they don't even under, understand yet, and that is quantum computing because it's a really tough one to understand. People don't really understand this. And one of the things that people talk about is the end of Moore's Law. And you you do mention this in the book, you tell us, just when Moore's Law appeared to have hit its end due to the physical limitations of semiconductors, quantum computing comes into the rescue. When transistors approach five nanometers, they start to become unstable due to the electrons behaving unpredictably. But quantum computing offers a new paradigm where instead of the classical binary state represented by a bit, a multi-state qubit achieved via superposition in extremely cold temperatures provides an extraordinary level of computing power. For example, a 50 qubit computer has 16 petabytes of memory. Quantum computing is no longer just a pipe dream. In fact, it is already available to anyone who can afford it today. And that that's another point. Everything starts expensive, and then the price starts to come down, it becomes more affordable, and it eventually becomes the norm. I'd love you to tell us a little bit about quantum computing, because this is something that me included, struggle to get my head around, because I have no idea just like exponential change, how dramatically this is going to change the world. Yeah, so you know, I think you, you touched on, um, you know, an important concept here, which is the fact that we are hitting the physical limitations of semiconductors. There's only so much computing power that you can pack into a silicon chip, right? And I think where we've hit the physical limitations of, uh, of semiconductors is at about the five nanometer level. It's really uh, tough to, to pack more computing power uh, at, at a smaller scale. Uh, and so people thought, well, this is the end of Moore's law, right? Uh, we, we've come to, to the end. Uh, and lo and behold comes quantum computing. Now, quantum computing is a completely different paradigm. So with you know semiconductors, what makes semiconductors powerful is that they're, they're able of switching between two states. It's on or off. And those two states represent zeros and ones. And as we know, everything that we do in computing, you know, our ability to be talking to each other via video 
is all based on zeros and ones. It's two different states. Now imagine a computing paradigm where you don't have just two states, you have several states. Think of the combinatorial power of, of that new paradigm. And that's what quantum computing is doing today. Now, people are saying, well, you know, it, it's, it's too difficult. There are several limitations to it. It's never gonna work. Well, we have it working today. So IBM Quantum is a service that you can just go online, sign up, and start using quantum computing today. So, you know, obviously this technology has to continue maturing, you know, costs have to come down, but it's something that is um, available today and it's going to revolutionize computing. Let's give another one as well, because you mentioned in the book how our brains are limited when understanding exponential change. Very clear on that one. But we also tend to judge new technologies on first impressions. And for example, I got our kids a basic 3D printer a few years ago, so they just mess around with it and actually from a creativity perspective. But when you experience that technology first, you think it's limited, it's not very good, etc. And then you take your eye off it, and then it continues to improve at an exponential rate, and you come back to it a few years later, and it's totally different. For example, as you highlight, even more exciting than 3D printing of houses, for example, is bioprinting. This is a manufacturing process where biomaterials such as hydrogels are combined with cells and growth factors to create tissue-like structures. It uses a material known as bioink to build structures layer by layer. And a company called Prelis Biologics is printing capillaries and Aviva Medical is able to produce kidneys. 3D printed organs are predicted to be available in the market by 2030. Again, very difficult to even foresee that because that looks like science fiction. And again, bringing back to the point you said earlier on, it's not just that the technology will be available and it's okay to print an organ. It's will the regulators allow you to put an organ, in, a printed organ inside a person. It's those little challenges are the last step and the most important actually to getting change through into society. You made a good point, you know, the example that you gave with your kids, you know, it, 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 it feels like a toy, right? It feels like something that, you know, this is really not that transformational. But when you take that technology and you apply exponential growth to it, and you see the ability to build, you know, houses at a fraction of the cost of traditional, you know, construction methods, when you see the ability to create human organs using bio ink, uh, it's just mind blowing what can be done with, with this technology. Obviously we're gonna run into all kinds of accelerants and inhibitors like we talked about before, but the potential is, is there. And, and you know we don't know when we'll be able to actually take a kidney that was you know, uh, built by 3D printing and, and use that on, on a human being, but you know, it could be 2030, it could be 2040, it's coming, it's coming. I was thinking as well, I, I have, um, I have a, a denture of a false tooth, I broke my tooth uh, when I was a child. And I was thinking about the pain of having to get the tooth molded and go and get a wait for it, I had to wait for it. So I had no tooth like this. And, and at the age I was, you know, I was in my early 20s, for example, and it was just embarrassing to, you know, have this issue. And now you can actually get a 3D, a 3D printed as you wait, <laughs> like so it will be done in seconds, and it will be perfect, it'll be exactly like your tooth is. And those are the type of things we're starting They're They're only the tip of the iceberg for what we're going to see in the future. And those kind of changes. And like you say, like any new technology introduces both good and bad, because this means ethical issues, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, for people as well that we'll talk maybe about if we've time at the end of today's show. But I, I wanted to mention another thing, because we're starting to see this about material science, for example. And I think a combination of the Suez Canal blockages, and the logistics and pipeline problems that we experienced during the pandemic highlighted our dependency on materials. And then if you add to that the increasing price and scarcity of materials, for example, of lumber across the world, 
the next point about ultra uh, about material science becomes ultra important. You tell us that materials are the raw ingredients that go into products. Materials are easily taken for granted because most people don't have a good grasp of the intricate work that goes into creating the materials that are used in today's products. Behind the scenes, materials, material science has enabled the creation and affordability of everyday items we consume today. As an example, the chief technology officer at Applied Materials explains that if you built a version of today's smartphone back in 1980, it would cost something like $110 million, be 14 meters tall, and require about 200 kilowatts of energy. That is the power of, advantage, of advances in material sciences. And again, this is like the boiling frog. We don't even notice that this is happening, but it's happening at an alarming rate. Yeah, I mean, most people don't realize, you know, how much technology goes into materials. And so I think the, the iPhone example is, is, is a classic, right? You can really feel how the power of material science can really transform industries and transform our ability to, uh, to do things that just, uh, you know, 30 years ago was not possible. Now, uh, you touched on a very critical point that I'd like to comment on, which is distribution, right? So what we have done is we've created um, a interdependent world um, with a lot of, you know, materials moving back and forth. Um, and uh, we are now realizing the fragility of the system, right? Because if there's a problem in the supply chain, if that distribution gets disrupted somehow, then you start to see some of the problems that we're experiencing today. Um, so going forward, I believe that what we're going to see is more local manufacturing using materials and technology like 3D printing uh, that will help address this problem. Um, so one, one particular industry that really uh, gets touched by this, and, and I think by producing locally, we're going to be able to not only increase production, but reduce costs significantly is food. Uh, so the production of food today, a lot of the cost of, of food production is distribution. So if you eliminate that distribution cost, uh, you can really reduce the price of, of food considerably. And now we have you know, new technologies that are coming up uh, like vertical farming, we have precision fermentation, and these technologies are going to completely transform the food industry and, and reduce cost at, at a level that's going to be, you know, we're gonna make food not only abundant, but affordable. Uh, and we have for the first time in history, the ability to eliminate hunger across the world. And we talked about printing, printing food as well. I, I think that's something that people still haven't got their head around, me too, because it seems so fantastical, but printing food, will be possible as well as other things. Amazing what's coming ahead of our times. And one thing I always find interesting, David, when I read a book like this about future technologies, future trends, is when you think of the tech billionaires that we have in the world, Jeff Bezos, for example, they have their finger on the pulse of all these things. They're investing in it. You think about Amazon, for example, they have invested well ahead of the time in distribution, understanding where distribution is going, understanding how important fulfillment and getting products to customers are on time better than any other postal service, for example. And that has been a key to their success. And this teases up nicely for the next session, because now that we've explored the convergence of exponential platforms, and how it's creating new ecosystems and driving mega trends that will have a profound impact on every aspect of human life, Let's share some examples of businesses that are managing these changes well, and also those that are struggling to adapt to these new times. You categorize these companies uh, as different types of animals with unique attribute, attributes in this wild exponential kingdom. You call them flash boiled frogs, disruptive unicorns, which is why I'm wearing my pin here of a unicorn, by the way, fast and furious gazelles, dancing elephants and dominating gorillas. Let's take them one at a time, David, and perhaps we'll share an example beginning with flash boiled frogs. 
Yeah, so you know, we just try to have a little bit of fun with this, and uh, so the flash boiled frogs. You know, it goes back to the to the fable of the boiled frog, and you know, the story goes that you know the frog was sitting on on water, and the temperature started to rise, and the frog couldn't feel the temperature rising, and by the time it realized that you know the the, the water was boiling, it was already too late, and it couldn't get out. And the point of the flash boiled frog is that now the temperature is changing so fast, right? If you don't perceive that change very early, uh, by the time you realize it's too late, you're already a boiled frog. Um, and then in the book, we give you know a few examples of uh, companies that uh, unfortunately did not perceive the change around them, and uh, and they are no longer uh, with us. So you know there, there are two classic examples that we we added to the book. One is Nokia. So um, I don't know if you had a Nokia phone. I, you know, at the time when, when I was using Nokia, it, it just seemed like, you know, this is it. This is the company that's going to dominate cell phones. In fact, you know, in November of 2007, Forbes magazine had them on their cover and they said, you know, 1 billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? And that was almost like a prophecy, right? Because that same year, Steve Jobs announced the iPhone and the rest is history. And that was the end of Nokia. Now, Nokia was um, a company that was known for innovation. That's what's really mind boggling. I mean, this is not a company that, you know, was traditional, that, that didn't understand technology, didn't understand innovation, um, but they missed one significant aspect of their business which was the fact that you know, software was eating the world, as uh, Mark Andreessen said uh, at one time. And, and, and Nokia was a hardware company and they missed that change. They missed that inflection point. And, and, and that was the end of Nokia. And then the other classic example was Blockbuster, right? So Blockbuster was the king of video. Uh, if you wanted to get a movie, uh, that was basically the only game in town. They dominated this industry and they became a little bit complacent and, and sometimes even arrogant. You know, they thought they dominated the industry. There's no way anybody's ever going to, to, to take uh, their, their position. In fact, their CEO, two years before they went bankrupt, the CEO of Blockbuster said, uh, neither Redbox nor Netflix are even on my radar of competition. They couldn't see Netflix as a competitor. And, and, and two years later, they were bankrupt and, and Netflix is, you know, the company that we know today. Let's jump to Uber, because many of our listeners work in mobility companies, and some also work in automobile manufacturing companies. And you say, delivering more than 15 million rides a day, Uber has transformed the personal transportation landscape. And this is just the beginning. Uber is a key player in the autonomous vehicle movement, and according to Jeff Holder, who heads up its AI lab and autonomous car group, the transition to autonomous vehicles will happen faster than anyone expects. Already, over 10% of millennials have opted for ride-sharing over car ownership. But this is just the beginning. Autonomous cars will be four to five times cheaper, and this makes owning a car not only unnecessary, but also expensive. But it's not just the vehicles driving themselves on the road. Uber has much bigger ambitions, you say. As Holden explained from the stage at the Uber Elevate conference, Uber's goal is to demonstrate flying car capabilities back in 2020 and have aerial ride-sharing fully operational in Dallas by 2023. Ultimately, they want to make it economically irrational to own and use a car. Now, I think, David, a lot of the car companies are aware of this and they're investing in mobility and ride-sharing platforms, etc. They're understanding this. But that was a difficult transition to get their head around, to understand this shift to an access economy where people don't want ownership, they want access, and they probably want to spend more of their money, money on experience and the experience economy. We have all those kind of shifts happening in parallel to the technological shifts. Uber is uh, is a really interesting uh, conversation because you know. So this goes back to 
uh, the, the, the book publishing uh, process, right? When, when, a, when an author starts researching uh, a subject and goes through the writing process, then goes through the publishing process, this takes quite a bit of time. It takes a year to two years for a book, for a book to come out. Now, in the exponential age, in, in a year to two years, a lot can change, right? So we used Uber as an example. Uh, and, and Uber is uh, a company that is a pioneer. You know, they're very ambitious. They are investing heavily in a lot of different aspects of, of, of their business. Um, and they were the company that brought to us the ability to hail a car through an app, right? And the logical conclusion would be that they would dominate what's coming up next, which is tra uh, transportation as a service. Well, now there are analysts that believe that Uber is not going to be the company that's going to dominate transportation as a service. They think maybe it's Tesla, maybe it's Waymo, it's the companies that are creating, you know, this electric uh, autonomous uh, vehicles capabilities, um, and that's going to drive, you know, TAS. And TAS is going to, I think we, we talked about it before, it's really going to revolutionize transportation completely. There are estimates that uh, the cost of transportation is going to be reduced uh, 10 times uh, as opposed to uh, owning a vehicle. Uh, so today, um, you know, uh, a vehicle costs, I think, somewhere around 80 cents per mile. Uh, the expectation is that with TAS, you'll be able to um, be transported with less than 10 cents uh, per mile. And the cost will, you know, continue to go down as this thing uh, evolves and grows. Um, and like we, we talked about before, this is not somebody somebody's dream. This is operational today. You know, Waymo is is operating uh, in in uh, Phoenix. Uh, they're operating in Las Vegas. I think um, uh, Mercedes Benz is operating um, in another city in the U.S. as well. So this is huge. It's happening today, and it's only going to become more and more prevalent. Yeah, and just to say, I did because I didn't say it. Uber was your example of the of the unicorn as well, the unicorn business. There's also Gazelle, which are really fast moving businesses as well. So maybe we'll give an example of that, and you can unpack what a Gazelle is. So the unicorns are the the billion dollar, you know, valuation private companies, and the Gazelles could be private, could be public, but these are companies that are doubling um, in sales uh, every every so often. Uh, so that was the, the original definition of a gazelle. And so in the book, we talk about bike dance, for, for example. And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, nobody ever heard of this name. Nobody knew what bike dance was. And some people may not even know today, but I bet most people will know uh, the product behind bike dance, which is uh, TikTok, which today is the most prevalent, you know, short video social media app that. Uh, that, that especially the, the younger generation uh, loves to use. And, you know, this company came out of China. Um, nobody knew anything about it. And, and it's going gangbusters, you know, in terms of growth. So um, I, I think that's, uh, that's one example of, uh, of a gazelle. Let's give an example of the dancing elephants. We alluded to it earlier on, but uh, I'll let you explain what this one is. Yeah, so the dancing elephant, uh, the classic dancing elephant is IBM, right? And and the, the idea came from, you know, uh, uh, Lou Gerstner wrote the classic, you know, who says the elephants can't dance, uh, referring to IBM. And like we talked about before, IBM was able to uh, traverse one S-curve after another, and it's been around for more than 100 years. Uh, so that's one example of a dancing elephant. But there's another one that is more recent, which I, I, I talk about quite a bit in the book, and that is Microsoft. So Microsoft used to be one of the most uh, influential, most valuable tech companies in the world. And then came the uh, you know, 21st century. And in the early 21st century, uh, Microsoft missed all the most significant uh, emerging technologies that were impacting the industry. So they missed cloud, they missed mobile, they missed social. 
And they realized that they had a problem. And if they didn't make a change, they weren't going to be around much longer. So what they did is they promoted uh, Satya Nadella to CEO. Uh, and Satya Nadella uh, is a, a fantastic example of how a leader can completely change an organization and transform it. And uh, the way he did it was by working on Microsoft's culture which to me is really fascinating because, you know, you'd think that culture is something that, you know, it's, it's the soft skill kind of thing. It's not something that a CEO would, uh, would be spending a lot of time on, but that's what he prioritized was changing the culture at Microsoft. So the background there is that, you know, what, and when he came in, he realized that a lot of people at Microsoft had what um, we understand as a fixed mindset. And the problem was that, you know, everybody at Microsoft was trying to prove that they were smart. You know, they're trying to outcompete everybody else, saying I'm smarter than, than the next guy. And the problem with that mindset is that if you think you're smarter than everybody else, then you're not open to new ideas. You're not open to learning. You're not open to considering other points of view. And he realized that that was a big problem. And he wanted to transform that organization into an organization that had a growth mindset. So with a growth mindset, you understand that, you know, uh, you don't know everything. Uh, there are other people there that you need to listen to. Uh, it goes back to the conversation about diversity of thought, about being open to new ideas, you know, the, the concepts behind innovation. Um, and one of the things that he... Uh, emphasized at Microsoft was empathy. You know, he talked quite a bit about how it was important for Microsoft employees to have empathy towards the customer, to have empathy towards other employees. And that was completely transformational at Microsoft. So if you look at Microsoft today, it's back again to being one of the most dominant, influential, one of the most valuable tech companies in the world. So that transformation of Microsoft, uh, to me, is, is really a great example what uh, can be done with the right leadership and, and the right way of, um, you know, changing changing the culture. Yeah, and it just shows you, doesn't it? Like we said that in the introduction, how important culture, people, common vision, even if they're on the exploit side or the explore side, the common vision, the common language, all that becomes so important. The, the final species you talk about is dominating gorillas. These are the companies that are so large and powerful, they impact many aspects of our lives from the day-to-day -day products and services we consume to our privacy and even our politics. If you live in modern society, you say it is hard not to be affected by these behemoths. We have You have chosen in this regard Google and its parent company Alphabet and also Amazon to represent the species yeah i mean these companies are absolutely um incredible in terms of you know their growth their reach their ability to impact um, everything that we do our entire lives business and and, and, and private lives um you know I, I think if i just look around my office here i got amazon and google all you know everywhere right in, in the computer that i'm talking to um in you know personal assistance uh, uh my e-commerce and 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 they're going beyond you know they're inst installing satellites to improve communication they're going to space they're creating autonomous vehicles i mean it's just mind-boggling the the reach of these two organizations um, and, you know, I think uh, the ambition of Jeff Bezos is something that um, it, it's just mind boggling what he has been able to accomplish. And, and, and he's not done. You know, this is this is a, an ongoing process. I, I feel in a way he, he's only he's only stabilized things for himself, as in he, he knows now he's OK. He's got his money. He's made a profitable company. Now he's like, now I get get to the real business. <laughs> it, feel, it feels a little bit like that with him. And um, l let's move on because I want to share in the time we have left the SBX platform as much as we can. We won't do it justice, so we're not going to try and squeeze everything in. But you tell us the answer to all this flux that we've experienced, we've talked about today and what's coming down the line for you and what you've created here. 
lies in adopting a robust methodology and you call your methodology the strategic planning for exponential era or SPX for short. You tell us SPX was born out of a set of principles and methods for dis from disciplines as diverse as software development, manufacturing, design and the military. It applies to strategic planning the benefits that other methods that encompass agility and experimentation have brought to the solution of complex problems when operating in an environment that is uncertain and that changes at such fast speeds. You tell us, despite how executive, executives may feel about the term strategic planning, the fact remains that strategy and planning are executive fun functions that are even more ex essential than ever before in this era, the exponential era. The problem is not with the label, but with the process itself. I'll leave it to you, David, to unpack this. Let us know about the origins of SPX, but also that challenge about strategy is your job as an executive and don't delegate that to some consultancy work with the consultancy but bring in a new methodology a common methodology across your organization we applied um, a a way of thinking that we call lateral thinking which we believe is going to be a, a really important skill to have um, in this new era uh, and lateral thinking is basically the ability to look at other domains and find solutions that you can leverage and apply to a different domain. So you're looking for patterns, you're looking for things that have worked in an environment that perhaps have characteristics that are similar to the environment that you're in, to the domain you're trying to solve a problem for, and then you find for you look for solutions that can that can work in your domain. So that's what we did. So we we were thinking about, you know, the problem we're trying to solve was strategic planning, as we've known in the last several decades, doesn't work anymore. So why, why doesn't it work? Well, strategic planning is a process that traditionally takes uh, a considerable amount of effort to, to come up with a plan. It may take a year, it may take more than a year. And then at the end of that process, you put together a document and a set of goals and, and, and initiatives that will be implemented over a period of you know five plus years. So if you look at the time frame that we're talking about here, we're talking about a period of you know perhaps six, seven years. Uh, a lot changes in, in the current environment, a lot changes in seven years. So you can't continue to uh, do strategic planning the way you used to do it in the past. So what, what was successful in the past is not going to make you successful in the future. So how do you solve that problem? What, 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 what are some of the things that we need to resolve in order to address um, this problem? And so the environment that we're talking about is an environment that is changing very fast, that's a little bit chaotic, you know, things are uncertain, things are vo uh, volatile, um, and you need to be able to use tools, uh, methods that you can apply to strategic planning that will help you be successful in the future. So we looked at other domains. We looked at manufacturing. We looked at you know, software. We looked at the military. And what we found is there are already several tools out there, several methodologies that have worked really, really well in those domains. You have lean in manufacturing. You have agile uh, in software development. Software development, you know, I come from a, an IT software world, and software development is, is quite complex. It's difficult to do. And uh, you know the agile methodology has really transformed uh, software development completely. Um, and then we have uh, you know the military, which uses OODA. Um, and we saw all these excellent tools, excellent methods that were dealing with problems very similar to the problems that businesses have to deal with today. And so you know there's no point in reinventing the wheel. We took the best tools that we could find in other domains. We found ways to connect the dots and then obviously insert some of our own experience and our own knowledge. And then we created SPX, which is a new way for you to deal with the strategic planning in an environment that's changing extremely fast. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know where things are going. 
But, you know, that doesn't mean that you throw away planning. Um, so there's a great uh, quote um, that says, you know, plans are useless, but planning is essential, right? So the process of planning is still very, very important. It's one of the executive functions of senior leaders. You have to plan. But planning has to be done in a very dynamic uh, process these days because things are changing extremely fast. So we took all of that and we patched it up in, in, uh, in this methodology that we call SPX. And I wanted to share some part of this because I found it really interesting, right? So you, you give the an overview of the changing speed of the business environment and society itself. So exponential change, morals, law, etc. Then you go into the convergence of all these different technologies, the different platforms. But then also your platform itself, your SBX methodology is a convergence in itself. And I loved when you talked about the convergence of the NSF, which is the National Science Foundation, and that how it finds solutions for the people living in the Arctic who are dealing with critical and urgent issues that require innovation from multiple sectors. They call it convergence research. I love this. And it's a way of bringing people together from various disciplines and backgrounds in what the NSF, the National Science Foundation, describes as a deeper, more intentional approach to accelerating discovery. The tenets of convergence research include it has to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. And I, I love that because it suggests both the convergence of everything, but also the neurodiversity of the people that you're engaging with. Maybe you'll say a word on this before we go a bit deeper into SPX. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's the same idea that we've been talking about. So we talked about Microsoft and the problem that they have with that, you know, fixed mindset. Um, and um, the fact that companies today really need to adopt is growth mindset. And this growth mindset is all about diversity of thought. It's about the ability to uh, do lateral thinking, to look across domains and to have empathy towards others and, and to really try to understand, you know, um, expertise. Uh, you don't have to become the expert yourself, but you need to be able to use lateral thinking to understand uh, what domains you can look at and understand how you can connect the dots from different domains to solve the problem that you're trying to solve in your own domain. And so convergence research and the things that they did to solve the problems uh, in the um, NFS is, is really um, using the same concepts, right? It's, it's converging um, different domains, different expertise, different capabilities to solve a particular problem in the domain that you're trying to solve. I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into SBX, but it, there was a line I loved and I loved it for probably ju just because it's so common in organizations. And you say here, while governance, governance in organizations today is transforming, the strategic planning processes and practices inculcated in most organizations is still anchored in the past. These can be harshly characterized as elaborate strategic planning processes in hermetically sealed boardrooms, isolated from the very people who are facing the realities of the business. Leadership often promotes their newly established edicts in the hope that the troops will engage in, the f in following the new company direction as still happens regularly, after going through the motions a few times, employees become desensitized and apathetic. After the all hands on meeting, they get straight back to work with little inspiration to change their day to day behaviors, because if they don't make their quarterly quarters, their quarterly numbers, they risk not getting a bonus. And this is why, as you know, well, 75% plus and I always think it's much higher than that of transformation efforts fail because you need to change the mental models before you change the, the business models. You need to change how people think, how they're rewarded, how they interact, how they communicate with customers is a huge part of all this before you're going to make any change in an organization. Yeah. And I think, you know, the other point that we try to 
to put across is the fact that you need to really be in touch with the edges of the organization. So you you know you can't be uh, isolated in a corporate boardroom making strategic decisions uh, and just getting you know input that's coming from the bottom up because that input gets filtered and you're not getting the full picture. So the only way you're going to get the full picture is for you to put yourself in a position to get data from the source, uh, talk to customers, talk to employees, talk to the people that are seeing the changes first, so you can start to get those early signals. And that's really, really important, you know, like we talked about before, is, is detecting those early signals before uh, it's too late. So let's jump into SBX a little bit deeper, because there's four core parts, four loops, if you will, to the SBX loop. And the first is to identify and monitor horizons, then generate insights, then formulate a rough plan, and finally to implement. And I really wanted to highlight, we'll only have time really for two. But the first one, because when you think about this, one of the big challenges, and many of our audience have had this, I have had it myself, where you're a little bit early. And oftentimes, you're actually when you think you're early, you're not at all. It's just that the organization hasn't given you any support or hasn't actually sought out those early indicators. And the indicators is a real, real challenge. We talked about that earlier on when we mentioned Retha McGrath. But let's get into that. Let's get into how to identify and monitor horizons as a first loop of the SPX loop. Yeah, so, you know, within that, um that loop, we, we have three components. One is research and observation. So some of it goes back to what I just said, right? You need to be talking to people that are seeing those changes firsthand uh, so you can detect those early signals. And that can be done through informal observations, uh, but you can also do research. And when we talk about research, you know, uh, one of the fallacies that we see with many organizations is you know we we, we talk about um, detecting these early signals, and a lot of them believe that they're doing it. Um, and so we ask them, you know, the, the next question: Well, how exactly are you doing that? How are you detecting the early signals? And you know, the typical answer is: Well, you know, we belong to industry associations. We get analyst reports. We have staff that is focused on you know understanding what's going on out there. Um, what they don't realize is the information that they're getting is the same information that everybody else is getting it. So it's it's too late, you know, that's not, you know, uh, effective. So while we, when we talk about research, we talk about detecting the early signals. You have to go to the places where you can really start to see the, the early signals as, as they are coming. And one of the tools that we recommend, and I think this is an untapped, um, data source that is publicly available for free. And those are patent databases. So there are some fantastic tools out there today that you can leverage to go and apply, you know, some data analytics and AI to really understand some emerging technologies um, and, and what's coming down the pike as you look at these patents, right? The patent database tells you a lot about what's coming uh, in the future. So that's one, one data source that you can leverage. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, even within organizations, there's a lot of different data sources that companies are just not tapping into. Um, you know, I, I think we went through a period of time um, where, and I spent a lot of time on this in my career, we uh, implemented systems uh, to, you know, uh, re-engineer business processes, and to start gathering data. Um, so we implemented ERP systems, we implemented CRM systems. Um, and in some cases, you know, companies created these siloed uh, systems that don't talk to each other. So the data is spread all over the place. And what companies need to do now is they really need to start organizing that data, cleaning the data, and then leveraging that data to really understand, you know, their customers understand what's going on with their business, and, uh, and, and that's another untapped opportunity here that's part of this, this, this loop within uh, SPX. And that's where you apply 
predictive analytics. You know, with AI, you're able to um, uh, see patterns and you can see how those patterns may evolve and you can start doing some predictions there. Now, I, you know, I, I always like to be a little bit careful with predictions because, you know, predictions are always dangerous. But so the, the point here is you're not trying to uh, necessarily be 100% accurate about the future. It's about looking at potential ranges of changes, potential uh, possibilities. And then you go into the next step of the process, which is you really need to do some experimentation to validate some of those uh, hypotheses that you created in the, in the early stage. And then the other piece of this is timing, right? We talked about how timing is so critical, right? Um, and so you really need to put everything within the context of, of a timing analysis process. This is why I opened with that example of the company. So companies nailing it, everything looks good, indicators show progress, future's bright, everybody doubles down on the strategy. Don't be wasting time going, thinking about the future and innovating. Let's exploit, exploit, exploit. Don't do exploration. Maybe tick the box with exploration just to satisfy the board member who's saying we need to be more innovative. But you mentioned here how Microsoft missed five of the most important technology trends of the beginning of the 21st century. They lost search to Google, smartphones to Apple, mobile OS to both Google and Apple, media to Apple and Netflix, and cloud to Amazon. And even though Satya Nadella did an incredible job through culture of gaining back ground on the cloud revolution, but this shows how such a successful company can miss those things because they double down on the strategy that they once had. And I think that's a really, really important aspect of all this. But one of the things, David, I thought was really useful was when you described the 3D printing revolution again, and I don't have an obsession with that, but it's just you mentioned it in the book again, and how things were started on an exponential curve. But nobody notices that they only start to notice it when media start to take notice or papers start to come out from the big consulting firms, whatever it may be, there's a bit of hype about it. But oftentimes, the horse has bolted a long, long time ago, and you may have actually missed the opportunity. I'd love you to share this as maybe a final story today. Yeah, and that is something that came out of uh, an exercise that we did, um, where we were looking at, you know, that first example that I gave of that organization that was in the middle of a, a transformation in their industry, and they, you know, they had uh, 100 years of success, and and we were trying to figure out what's what's happening in that industry, what's coming next. And uh, so we applied our own methodology to try to solve that problem. And one of the things that we, we did is we looked at patent databases, right? And then we saw, we, we looked at autonomous vehicles, we looked at uh, 3D printing, we looked at 5G, and then we started to see the convergence. And we started to see patents that were being um, filed by organizations, the same organizations, the same entrants that were threatening this company that we're working with, were filing patents for autonomous vehicles that were going to be uh, manufacturing uh, in transit, on demand, with personalized solutions. So you place your order online, um, they, you know, the AI is going to know your preferences, it's gonna, going to know what you like, um, and they will be able to put the order in and the materials are going to come into uh, mobile um, factories, if you will. And as that uh, material is transported towards the point of consumption, you're going to use 3D printing to manufacture that solution. I mean, we were just amazed that there were patents out there for this stuff. And, and that was things that uh, you know, made us realize here are some really important signals that they need to look at and understand where this thing is going. Yeah, I absolutely love that story. And uh, you know, one of the things you tell us here, I'll quote this, you say many companies have a bias toward using current and lagging indicators to help them make strategic decisions. Financial metrics such as revenues, profits and return on investment are lagging indicators. By the time a shifting horizon has had an impact on your financials, it's already too late that horizon has already passed and you failed to intercept it. 
current indicators such as the key performance indicators that you typically find on balance scorecards are good at telling you where you currently stand, but they are not of much help when it comes to telling you where things are going. In fact, current indicators can become blind spots as executives create incentive plans based on key performance indicators that focus on short-term results. They can also give executives the illusion that they are identifying and monitoring horizons when in reality they are only seeing what everyone else already knows. That was a huge frustration for me. I worked in the media industry and it used to drive me crazy that we were getting, there was sales executives getting rewarded for accelerating the demise of the industry because they were bundling digital as well as traditional and it just to, just to drive me absolutely crazy. But uh, I thought a, a good way to finish today's show would be to wrap up with the future because you do dedicate a whole chapter to the future. We do a lot of that on the show, David, and I, I wanted to really give a flavor of your methodology in particular today. But I thought we'd wrap up with a battle cry for the future. But before that, you tell us in chapter, you tell us in the last chapter that the pandemic was a wake up call for all of us, a dress rehearsal for the profound and difficult choices we all have had to make in a world of chaotic changes and disruptive forces. You say it has come with a volume and velocity that we are not accustomed to, making it difficult to adapt. It forced uncomfortable changes, and the future will cause political, social, and ethical changes. Let's share your top-level view of some of these changes coming down the line, David. Wow. Aiden, there's so much to unpack here. <laughs> you've, you've got 60 seconds. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I mean, there's so much in here that I'm actually uh, writing the next book. Oh, congratulations. And the next book is all about this. It's about the future. It's about um, how what we're experiencing today is going to impact us as individuals and, and business and society in general. Um, so I think the changes are going to be very profound. Um, I tend to be optimistic about the future. I think uh, we're going to, uh, in about, you know, I don't know exactly how long it's going to take, but eventually we're going to get to a world of abundance. Uh, because if you just look at the leading indicators, uh, every, everything is pointing to, to that potential, that possibility. And, you know, if we, if we just keep things together long enough for the exponential curve to, um, to, to be realized, uh, I think we're going to be in a very good future. The danger is there is a chasm that we need to cross. And that is what we're, we're experiencing right now. So between now and that time when uh, the future looks good, where there's abundance, where there is sustainable growth, um, there's a danger. And we need to navigate through this period of time. And so in the next book, I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about what we need to do to cross the chasm. And, and this is not much different than all the things that we talk about in business from an innovation standpoint, right? We're going through a transition. There's changes that are going on. Changes are always painful, right? We as humans, we don't like change. We like to be comfortable in the status quo you know, it's things that we're familiar with and, and it feels good, then we don't want to change. But change is important. You got to keep moving forward. Um, so how do we navigate through this, this period of time that's going to be very painful, very chaotic? Um, and, and, and I think my view to it is we need to apply the exact same change management principles that we apply in business to society and to this, this period that we're going to be transitioning through. I'm so on the same page as you and it's why on the show I toggle between the individual and the organization on a regular basis. I also think about stuff like the whole idea of capability building. So building the capability before you need it is just like, for example, I, I do cold showers. I don't know if you do that. Cold showers. I do intermittent fasting. And what those things do is they're controlled stress. They're stress you opt to enter into even even physical training 
I'm about to go to the gym now. Physical training is about actually stressing your body, but you you own that stress, you control that. And I think about the same thing with the changes we're going to go through in society that you got to prepare yourself. And one of the ways you can prepare yourself is actually physically, mentally get ready for these changes. I think of it, David, as um, a snow globe. And you pick up the snow globe, you give it a shake, it's chaotic, there's snow all over the place, we're going into that period. But the snow always settles. And it will become peaceful times again, we're just going through a period in life that's really exciting, where it's changing. And we'll come out the other side, I'm sure, very, very positively. I have a final quote that I pulled from the show, a very short one. Before I share that, I'm going to ask you to have your final message for audience today. But also before even that, where can people find you find out about your more about your work, your consulting practice, etc. Yeah, so I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, that's the one social media uh, that I use the most. So you can look me up on uh, LinkedIn under David Espindola. Um, I also have um, a website for the book itself, which is the exponential era book.com. So you can find more information about the book there. Um, I have my own personal website as well, where I talk about some of the things that I'm working on, uh, davidespindola.com. Um, so those are probably the best ways to, uh, to get a hold of me. Okay, well, I'll share this final quote for me, and then I'll hand it over to you to today to close today's show. The quote I picked was quite simple. You said, today's opportunity, if left untapped, can turn into tomorrow's threat. Or as you like to say, the difference between a threat and an opportunity is the time horizon in which you see it. I absolutely love that as a final quote. Over to you, David, what's your final message for our audience and for society in general? Yeah, so thanks for bringing up that that quote. And, and I think it's, uh, it's something that we um, really believe in, you know, timing is so important. And if you wait until the early signals, like we said before, is obvious for everyone else, you're already behind the curve. So don't, don't, don't get behind the curve. So the message that I have uh, for your audience is this. Um, so you touched on COVID, right? And, and how COVID has impacted us significantly in, in the last you know, two years have been really difficult for a lot of people. And, and my heart goes out to those that have been impacted by this, you know, a lot of people lost uh, loved ones. But if there is a silver lining in, in COVID, it's the fact that I think it gave us an opportunity to reflect on what's really important in life, right? I think we've, we're going on this treadmill um, of running, 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 busy, busy, busy. And we never you know, stop to think about what really matters. And I think COVID gave us an opportunity to really uh, rethink about what's important in our lives. And now we're seeing, we're seeing this movement called the Great uh, Resignation, which is really mind boggling. I think a lot of it is, is, is a result of people thinking and reflect upon what's my purpose, right? Uh, do, do I just want a job so that I can get money and accumulate stuff? Um, or do I want to engage in activities that are purposeful, that, that fulfill my needs for, you know, uh, what I call taking care of the soul? And so, um, you know, that's what the next book is going to be all about. It's, it's going to be all about the changes that are coming and how we need to start focusing on what really matters in uh, taking care of our soul. Author of The Exponential Era, Strategies to Stay Ahead of the Curve in an Era of Chaotic Changes and Disruptive Forces, David Espindola, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan. It's, uh, it was a great pleasure talking to you. Like I said before, I'm a big fan of your show. You do a fantastic job, so keep up the great work. And as always, thank you to our partner Zai sponsoring the show for this year 2022. You can thank them too by checking out their website hellozai.com. Who are Zai? They build integrated financial services for digital native and non native businesses. Check them out again, hellozai.com. And I'll see you next week.